Public Health Approaches to Violence Prevention. Hello, my name is Monica Wendell, and I am the Associate Dean for Public Health Practice at the University of Louisville School of Public Health and Information Sciences. I also serve as the Principal Investigator of our Center for Excellence in Youth Violence Prevention, one of six such centers funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention nationally. The purpose of this training is to provide an overview of violence in the U.S. and to discuss some evidence-based public health approaches to preventing violence in multiple forms. We have four primary objectives for this training today. By the end of this session, participants should be able to identify multiple common forms of violence, articulate why violence should be viewed as a public health issue, describe several evidence-based approaches to violence prevention, and discuss a public health strategy for violence prevention. To give you an idea of the content of today's training, let me provide a brief overview. First, we will discuss various ways violence is manifested and what different types of violence can look like. Next, we will talk briefly through some illustrative statistics showing violence epidemiology in the United States. Third, we will review identified risk and protective factors that cut across multiple forms of violence. Then, I will describe the recommended interventions for violence prevention as provided by the National Preventive Services Task Force, as well as two additional public health-based violence prevention intervention models that appear to be promising. Finally, I will summarize the public health strategies for violence prevention that are promoted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in their newly released Violence Prevention Technical Package. Although public health is more often seen as dealing with issues such as prevention and control of infectious and chronic disease, exposures, and sanitation, violence is also considered an important public health issue. Several factors highlight why public health professionals should be concerned with preventing violence. First of all, there is preventable risk. The risk factors for different types of violence are largely preventable. Next, violence and exposure to violence has measurable effects on both physical and mental health. We see significant morbidity and mortality related to violence of multiple kinds. That morbidity and mortality may manifest in physical and mental outcomes, disability, and death. Also, there are distinct disparities in health outcomes related to violence based on gender, gender expression, socioeconomic status, race ethnicity, sexual orientation, and other characteristics. These disparities, as well as the outcomes again, are preventable. Another concern for public health related to violence is the substantial health care cost associated with treatment of both physical and mental health effects of violence. These costs include billions of dollars, both direct and indirect cost. Direct costs include the cost of care for treating injury, ongoing disability, and mental health ramifications related to violence. Those mental health ramifications may include things like depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Indirect costs related to violence include the cost of disability, lost productivity, the cost of law enforcement related to addressing violence, as well as the cost of criminal justice and correction systems. Just as an example, the cost of child abuse and neglect is estimated at $124 billion per year in the U.S. So this clearly has a significant economic impact. 
When discussing violence as a public health issue, it is important to understand that violence can take many forms. In understanding violence and in order to address violence, we typically look at several specific and distinct categories of violence. As defined by the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the CDC, the term intimate partner violence describes physical violence, sexual violence, stalking, and psychological aggression, including coercive acts, by a current or former intimate partner. Also included within this category are situational couple violence and teen dating violence. The Federal Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, which was reauthorized in 2010, defines child abuse and neglect as any recent act or failure to act on the part of a parent or caretaker, which results in death, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse or exploitation, or an act or failure to act which presents an imminent risk of serious harm. This provides guidance for state laws regarding violence against children. Most state laws are focused on parents, guardians, or caregivers such as teachers or daycare workers and generally do not include harm caused by other people such as acquaintances or strangers. Some state laws also include a child's witnessing of domestic violence as a form of abuse or neglect. When talking about youth violence, it is important to note that definitions of who is included in the category of youth varies. Some organizations consider individuals under 18 years of age youth, basically those who are not legally adults. Other organizations consider people under, 20, under 21 youth, while still others, including the CDC, count youth anyone ages 10 to 24 years. This age range considers that many aggressive or violent behaviors that develop during childhood and adolescence can continue into young adulthood and beyond. Similar to child abuse and neglect, the definition of elder abuse includes action or failure to act on the part of a caregiver that causes or creates a risk of harm to an older adult defined as 60 years of age or older. Elder abuse can take several forms from the more commonly recognized acts such as physical abuse, psychological abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect to protect or provide for an elder's basic needs to less obvious forms of abuse, such as financial abuse or exploitation. Sexual violence includes any sexual act attempted or committed against someone without their freely given consent or exposure to unwanted sexual experiences. Finally, suicide is considered a form of violence that is perpetrated against oneself with the intent to die. Given the multiple types of violence we have just discussed, we could spend hours examining the epidemiology of each type of violence. That, however, is beyond the scope and purpose of this training. Instead, I have included a fairly general statistic for each type of violence discussed to provide some context for understanding the reach and magnitude of that type of violence in the United States. For example, one in four women and one in seven men have experienced severe physical violence by an intimate partner. 702,000 victims of child abuse and neglect were reported to Child Protective Services in the year 2014, resulting in 1,580 deaths. It's important to note in this that 702,000 victims were reported. It's reasonable to assume that there were many more victims who were not reported. Homicide is the second leading cause of death for young people ages 15 to 24 years old, and among those, 83% are killed with a firearm. In 2008, one in 10 adults over 60 reported some form of abuse in the past year. Nearly one in five women have been raped in their lifetime. 
And finally, nearly a half million people attempted suicide in 2013 in the U.S., resulting in over 40,000 actual committed suicides. This just gives you an idea of the scope of the different types of violence in the United States. The social ecological model, first introduced by McElroy and colleagues in 1988, has shifted the paradigm in thinking about determinants of health and health behavior. Historically, intervention would focus solely on individuals, primarily those at risk of perpetration of violence, in attempts to change their knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, values, and skills related to pro-social behaviors and relationships. However, our understanding of health has become more sophisticated and it is now widely recognized that myriad factors beyond the individual have significant influence on risk, behavior, and outcomes. The social ecological model illustrates these factors as nested systems, with each encompassing those preceding, starting with individual level determinants as mentioned, then moving on to interpersonal, organizational, community, policy, culture, and determinants inherent in the physical environment. Examples of individual level determinants of violent behavior include attitudes towards violence, lack of skills for coping, stress management, and anger management, and poor conflict resolution skills. Examples of interpersonal determinants include relationships with poor communication and poor conflict resolution practices. Examples of organizational determinants are tied to the organizations in which individuals participate. For example, organized gangs in some communities contribute to violence through their activities and social norms. Community characteristics that contribute to violence also include social norms more broadly, as well as how communities are organized and how equitably resources are distributed. Policy level determinants may influence violence from a preventive aspect or as a deterrent. For example, school policies that create environments where students are appropriately supervised may prevent acts of violence from occurring, whereas school policies that inflict strict punishment for acts of violence may serve as more of a deterrent. Both types of policies are determinants of violence. Cultural determinants shape what whole populations of people share as values or beliefs. For example, the prevalence of violence in television, movies, music, and video games normalize violence and in fact make it recreational, which can detract from the perception of violence as a serious issue. Finally, elements of the physical environment can influence violence by creating or limiting access to resources and services, as well as characteristics of how spaces are developed contribute to how safe they are, or are perceived to be, or alternately can make them conducive to crime. For example, vacant and abandoned properties in urban areas are often correlated with crime. Each type of violence discussed has unique risk factors that contribute to it. However, there are several risk factors that have been identified that are common across multiple types of violence. Understanding these risk factors is important because the same way that each of them increases risk for different types of violence, addressing any one of them also has the potential to reduce risk for multiple types of violence. The common risk factors that have been identified for multiple types of violence include a history of victimization, poverty, limited social, educational, and economic opportunities, racism-related stress, and social norms about violence, gender, and race ethnicity. In addition to the identification of common risk factors for violence, 
Research has also identified some common protective factors for violence that are cross-cutting across the different types of violence. Those particular common protective factors include social connectedness, which for youth may, may include a stable connection to caring adults, ties to pro-social peers, and connection to community, as well as social norms that promote pro-social behavior, access to social, economic, and educational opportunities, and access to supportive resources and services. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force was created in 1984 as a volunteer panel of experts in prevention and evidence-based medicine. One of the roles of the task force is to rigorously review existing peer-reviewed research and to make recommendations regarding interventions that have been shown to be effective. In regard to violence prevention, the Preventive Services Task Force offers four specific recommended types of interventions. As you will see, the evidence is most promising in the areas of child abuse and neglect and youth violence. Unfortunately, the task force has not yet made recommendations for interventions to prevent intimate partner violence, sexual violence, elder abuse, or suicide. The identified evidence-based approaches include early childhood home visitation, which is recommended to prevent child maltreatment, individual or group cognitive behavioral therapy, which is recommended to reduce psychological harm from traumatic events among children and adolescents, school-based programs, which may be informational, cognitive, or social skill building, and are recommended for reducing violent behavior among school-aged children and adolescents, as well as therapeutic foster care, which is recommended for adolescents experiencing chronic delinquency. Now let's look in more detail at what each of these recommended interventions entails. In 2002, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force reviewed the evidence and found sufficient support to recommend early childhood home visitation programs to reduce child abuse and neglect. These programs should be applicable to most families considered to be at high risk of child maltreatment. For example, some of those risks include single or young mothers, low income households, or families with low birth weight infants. In a home visit program, the visits may be initiated during pregnancy the current evidence indicates that longer duration programs produce larger effects and programs of less than two years duration did not appear to be effective. The recommended length of program is two years. Childhood home visitation programs may be conducted using nurses, social workers, paraprofessionals, or community peers. The evidence showed that professional home visitors may be more effective than trained paraprofessionals, but longer duration programs using trained paraprofessionals can also be effective. In 2006, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force reviewed existing evidence and found sufficient support to recommend cognitive behavioral therapy for reducing psychological harm for youth who have experienced trauma. A traumatic event is defined as one in which a person experiences or witnesses actual or threatened death or serious injury, or a threat to the physical integrity of self or others. Trauma may take the form of single or repeated events that are natural or man-made and intentional or unintentional. A natural traumatic event may be something like a natural disaster, a hurricane, a tornado, a tsunami, whereas a man-made traumatic event may be something like an act of terrorism. An unintentional traumatic event may be something like a severe illness or a severe car accident, while an intentional traumatic event may be something like a sexual assault. 
Traumatic exposures may have only temporary effects or result in no apparent harm. However, traumatic exposures may result in psychological harm and lead to long-term health consequences. Cognitive behavioral therapy is often administered by doctoral level professionals or other clinicians with graduate degrees such as social workers or counselors. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be delivered individually or in a group setting. And either type of cognitive behavioral therapy is evidence-based and recommended by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. This kind of therapy is recommended for youth who display psychological symptoms from trauma. These psychological symptoms from trauma are related to adverse childhood events, particularly for children who have multiple exposures. Cognitive behavioral therapy for traumatized children can use several different techniques to address um, the psychological harm for those who have experienced trauma. Those techniques include exposure techniques, such as reviewing past traumatic events, learning stress management and relaxation techniques, correction of inaccurately remembered events, and reframing counterproductive perceptions of trauma. The current research indicates that cognitive behavioral therapy is effective at reducing anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder among youth who have experienced trauma. In 2005, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force reviewed existing evidence and found adequate support to recommend universal school-based programs for violence prevention. A universal school-based program is one that reaches all students in schools, as opposed to those that target specific students. Programs found to be effective are those that target specific knowledge and skills, including emotional self-awareness, emotional control, self-esteem, social skills, problem solving, conflict resolution, and teamwork. The existing evidence has found that these types of school-based programs reduce both victimization and perpetration of violence among youth. In 2002, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force reviewed existing evidence and found sufficient support to recommend therapeutic foster care to reduce violent crime among adolescents ages 12 to 18 with a history of chronic delinquency or antisocial behavior. Therapeutic foster care is used to describe two distinct forms of treatment. Program intensive therapeutic foster care is often used as an alternative to incarceration hospitalization, or other forms of residential treatment for adolescents with a history of antisocial behavior or chronic delinquency. Group-based therapeutic foster care, or cluster therapeutic foster care, is often provided to children with severe emotional disturbance through groups of foster families that cooperatively care for a group of children. In both types of therapeutic foster care, Families are highly trained to provide a highly structured environment, separation from the context or peers that are related to the problem behavior, as well as they are trained in behavior modification techniques. So typically in therapeutic foster care, adolescents are placed for several months in foster families who are specially trained and those families typically are compensated for their work. In that environment, they are provided structure where they are rewarded for positive social behavior and penalized for disruptive and aggressive behavior. Programs that have been reviewed have lasted on average six to seven months. In April 2003, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force reviewed existing evidence and found sufficient reason to recommend against policies 
that facilitate transferring juveniles to the adult justice system. In other words, the evidence looking at policies that do facilitate treating juveniles as adults in the justice system caused more harm than good. Research showed that these policies actually increased recidivism, increased likelihood of other violent outcomes, and resulted in higher rates of suicide among juveniles who were incarcerated in adult facilities. In addition to these evidence-based interventions that have been recommended by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, other promising interventions have been identified. One such intervention is called Cure Violence. The Cure Violence model was founded by Dr. Gary Slepkin, who is a professor at the University of Illinois. The Cure Violence model approaches community violence as a public health issue and has three primary components. Interrupt violence, treat those at highest risk, and change norms. Within this model, trained violence interrupters and outreach workers prevent shootings by identifying and mediating potentially lethal conflicts in the community and following up to ensure that the conflict does not reignite. In looking at high risk, these interrupters and outreach workers work to prevent retaliation, mediate ongoing conflict, and keeping conflicts that exist cool, so following up with conflicts for as long as needed to ensure that the conflict does not escalate to become violent. Trained culturally appropriate outreach workers also work with those at highest risk to make them less likely to commit violence by talking to them about the cost of using violence and helping them to obtain social services they need. This speaks back to common protective factors, which is access to resources and services. Finally, workers engage leaders in the community as well as residents, business owners, faith leaders, service providers, and those at high risk for violence in conveying the message that violence should not be viewed as normal, but as a behavior that can be changed. Workers coordinate with existing and establish new block clubs, tenant councils, and neighborhood associations, and try to spread positive norms to create a norm of nonviolence among the community. Another promising intervention is called Green Dot. Green Dot is a campus-based or community-based bystander intervention model. This involves training and equipping individuals in different settings to be bystanders who interrupt violence and who change norms of violence within a community. The Green Dot program addresses power-based personal violence through proactive behaviors. These behaviors may be intervening in high-risk situations, helping de-escalate situations where violence may occur, and demonstrating intolerance of violence as a norm. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have recently released in 2016 their violence prevention, violence prevention technical package, outlining four overarching strategies for violence prevention. These strategies include focusing interventions on childhood and adolescence in order to achieve long-term impact, focusing interventions on populations and communities at highest risk for experiencing or perpetrating violence, focusing interventions on shared risk and protective factors that are most important for reducing multiple forms of violence, and identifying, implementing, and scaling up approaches that have cross-cutting impact. Within a public health approach in looking at violence prevention, we recognize the need for interdisciplinary efforts. Violence is a complex issue. It affects individuals, families, communities, and societies in numerous ways. 
Many disciplines have addressed violence, but none has yet solved it. From public health to psychology, sociology, social work, law, nursing, medicine, and many other disciplines, different interventions have been attempted, and some have had promise, but none has yet solved the issue. So bringing perspectives, methods, and approaches of different disciplines together can enhance our understanding and effectiveness in addressing violence. In addition, we recognize a need for strong surveillance. Data for monitoring incidents, trends, outcomes, and the cost of violence totally depends on what is reported at the current time. These reporting mechanisms vary from municipalities to states across the country. In order for us to fully understand the breadth and scope of violence that is occurring, as well as trends, we need consistent standardized data for monitoring these things. We need consistent data to evaluate the effectiveness of population level interventions. We need data on risk and protective factors across different populations. And the data from different types of surveillance systems need to be understood comprehensively. Finally, we recognize the need for rigorous applied research. Research around what works, integrating what we understand from different disciplines, will help us understand what is working to reduce violence. It will also help us understand how those interventions work to reduce violence. We need to look at whether certain interventions apply more broadly to different types of violence prevention or whether they only work in specific instances of violence. And we also need rigorous applied research on how to scale up translate and disseminate effective interventions most effectively. In summary, violence is a significant public health issue, and as we have discussed, it manifests in various forms. What we do understand is that violence and the risk factors that contribute to violence are preventable. The literature indicates some evidence-based interventions for different types of violence as have been reviewed and recommended by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. But we must acknowledge that our current knowledge is limited and we need to grow the knowledge base by incorporating the expertise and methods of multiple disciplines. And finally, there must be a strong link between research, policy, and practice in order for us to effectively address violence prevention.